We're joined here today with Margot Thompson and Mark Alt. Margot and Mark, thank you for joining me here today. We're here to discuss how quality practices can provide 2020 vision in foresight for assisting you in both growing and protecting your practice into the future. Margot, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with the Quality Review Program? Yes, um, I've been working in public practice for the last 40 years, which is a long time. Um, and my first involvement with quality assurance was um, I actually was working for a practitioner who was on the New South Wales Public Practice Committee. And he was a forward thinker and he, along with the rest of the committee at that time, felt that quality assurance was something that we needed to introduce. And I remember downloading material from America on it and what they did in the quality review program in America. So it's something that I've been involved in since the beginning. I was in I was one of the first reviewers, um, well, one of the first people to actually attain the title of QA reviewer. And um, it's been a very interesting progression through that time. And, you know, my practice is maintained still at the same time as do it being a QA reviewer. And so in my practice, we do tax compilation. Um, I am an SMSF auditor and a registered company auditor. And so, um, and currently about to become a financial planner. So that's just another thing that's going to happen to us as we move forward. It's but a brave new world of financial planning. Yes. Which will <laughs> affect us, all, all of us accountants in ways it will. that we are aware of, but some of us might not even be fully aware of the impact, the full impact it'll have on our practices going forward. So Thank you, Margot. Over to you, Mark. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice yeah, thanks, and where Jill. you've come from? Um, I've been in practice for over 25 years and I've seen, I suppose, practices evolve from a paper-based arrangement where there was separate input to now what well, I'm running for my practice a full paperless office with three to four screens per desk and it really has changed and evolved over a period of time and certainly will continue to do so. Practice uh, specialises in biz services, um, mainly for small business, micro businesses, individuals, uh, a lot of tax. Um, and over that 25 odd years, I've always had a role in financial services to some extent, um, either direct or indirect. And so the opportunity post 30 June also in regard to financial services is certainly a huge change, I think, not only for my practice, but practices in general as to which way they wish to go. Fantastic. You've both been with the Quality Review Program for some time, Margot, since its inception in 1994, which is 22 years ago now. And Mark, you've recently joined the Quality Review Program. When did you start? Uh, I started, I'd say now about five years, five years ago, um, after going through quite a rigorous training program. Um, and that was not only a challenge, but also very enjoyable and perhaps provided insight as to some of the cornerstones of a practice that perhaps aren't as commonplace as uh, perhaps everybody should consider. Fantastic. Margot, you have a special role within the Quality Review Program. Could you explain that to us? Yes. Um, I joined the Quality Review Advisory Committee last year and um, that committee is um, has two QA reviewers on, on the actual panel and it has um, two um, CPA members who are in public practice and it also has um, management staff from CPA Australia on the committee and we have an independent chair. Last year the independent chair was um, from the legal profession and the current chair is um, a civil engineer and they bring some interesting insight to us from other professions as to um, how to continue with our quality control programs. And um, we, on that committee, we sort of, we do an oversight of the program and um, with collaboration with everybody, we, we look at how we can improve the program and how things can, the policies and procedures that will, will that program will have going forward, yeah. So the core function of the Quality Review Advisory Committee is to provide advice to to management, is that correct? Yes, it And is. also to, to bring with it a perspective of what the public practitioner is currently faced with 
uh, the environment that they're practicing in and how we can then tailor the program to meet the needs of the regulatory position as well as the member as in public well as practice. The members and the way we're, what we're finding when we actually go out to do the reviews and also by having um, other public practitioners on the committee, they bring the views from their practice and what they would like to see and how, how the quality control or the quality review process assists them in their practice. Yeah. It's great to see a governance structure at that particular level considering that the quality review program affects every member who holds a public practice certificate, every member has to be reviewed. So it must be comforting, if you, if you put your member hat on, it must be comforting to know that there's governance at that particular level, that it's not just something that's potentially run by an organisation, it does have the input of members. So you're really governed for members by members. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's the whole idea of it, yes. Mark, what is involved in becoming a quality reviewer? You alluded to us before that you've recently become a reviewer in the last five years. Could you tell us a bit about what attracted you to becoming a quality reviewer and then what the process was like to become a quality reviewer? Sure, thanks Jo. Um, I guess I've always looked at my practice and building the practice from bottom up and I've had that opportunity rather than acquire a practice or uh, move into a practice o over time. So I had the opportunity to actually prepare the practice. So I had that interest already at that stage. Then I had my first quality assurance review and my reviewer at the time had actually alluded and suggested that it's something that perhaps I should consider based on my review. And then I went through and considered what the requirements were. And of course, uh, being a public practice certificate holder, completing a review to an acceptable level. Um, I suppose, I think it was uh, periods of time that required you know, of, of practice. Then the application process went through, there was interviews with appropriate people to, I suppose, gain the, in my mind, the, the correct approach and the correct attitude to becoming a quality reviewer. Um, and then from there, the training, which was quite in depth, the training commenced. And from training also was a opportunity to go on a review with a experienced reviewer to see actually, I suppose, to put the theory and the training into practice, to also understand how members under review acknowledge and accept the process, um, because people do have varying degrees of uh, uh, understanding of the practice, especially for their first reviews. Um, and, and from there, there's the constant and ongoing training, and uh, that's, that's most important. And I guess separate to training, is also the maintenance of knowledge of current standards. They do change. And also important to that is as practices change to, I suppose, utilise the, the standards as they are and ensure that quality control manuals, risk management frameworks are maintained, they're up to date and that they're reflective of practice operations. They effectively become the guidelines. So the ongoing training is not just a formalised training program, it's also I guess what, what I do in my practice and um, as part of the review process, what I discuss with members under review. The CPA Australia quality review model is a peer review model. It has been a peer review model for its entirety since, since inception in 1994. Why do you think that's so important to have a peer review model as opposed to reviewers that are potentially employed by the organisation who are disconnected potentially with public practice, then going out and doing those particular reviews. What do you feel is so important about that peer review model? I think members under review have an affiliation with people also within practice. We cover the same issues, we certainly come across the same concerns, and we also have positive wins and we have uh, threats and, and issues within the practice by having the opportunity, not only as part of the review process, to have, uh, it's very rare for somebody external to a practice, for another person to come in, review the practice, review the operations, and have a very open discussion with a principal or PPC holder of the practice to identify and discuss issues moving forward. I've always taken the view that the review process isn't just about ticking boxes, it's actually an education program but it's also a great opportunity for members under review to be able to ask questions of 
any direction without any fear or favour and it provides them the added comfort that at least somebody else is assisting them and trying to help them with their practice and their, the opportunities and, uh, and issues that they address on a day-to-day -day basis. Mark, it's a very interesting point that you raised about education being at the cornerstone of what we do within the Quality Review Program. Our mantra within the Quality Review uh, Administration and Management Team is that compliance falls out of great education and training, that you wouldn't go and sit an exam ordinarily before you've studied the content. And so therefore, our members, if they've got areas of non-compliance, it's generally as a result of them not being able to keep abreast of every single change, which we also struggle with. So we completely empathise with our members' position there. Why do you think it's so important that it's an education focus rather than just a simple tick the box compliance focus? That's to both of you. Yeah, well, it always has been an education focus. That's where we've always been. It's about making sure that the members understand the standards know how to apply them in their practice and I think because we are practitioners we've had to implement these standards in our practice and so we have that practical everyday usage of it um, and can help them to do that and often members struggle with how to actually put things in place it's not that they don't know they're there they know they exist but they don't know how they can actually put them in their practice so um, because we've actually had to do that we can then help them do it. And so the education is very important. Ticking boxes doesn't achieve it necessarily a good end product or a good result in a practice. But having a process that you go through and making sure that that process is correct and that it fits with people, because you're dealing with people. Um, and you know the practices want to be able to they want to do the best they can for their clients. Mm. That none of them want to um, produce something that is below par. Mm. They, they want to meet the standards, they want to do the right thing, but they need to be able to do it pr in a practical way. A and that's, part what, that, that's really what the QA is about. So if you were coming up to a review and all of our reviewers uh, have to yep. be whiter than white, they are reviewed every three to four years right on their due date, right on the due time, because our reviewers obviously have to be compliant before they can go out and review other people. Would you be at all worried about a quality review that was about to happen in your practice? Or would you look at it as an opportunity for someone with fresh eyes to come in, look at your practice, and be able to have a peer-on-peer -peer discussion about not just necessarily the standards, but the profession as a whole? I've actually got my QA review coming up very shortly. Um, I don't, as, as would be expected, I have never met my reviewer. It's an interesting process being a reviewer myself and being reviewed. Uh, we've already had a discussion in respect to the planning meeting. That was a very interesting discussion. Uh, to the extent that we both knew the process and therefore it allowed us to discuss other issues. From my point of view, I welcome another pair of eyes mm -hmm. looking over what I do in my practice, notwithstanding that I'm a QA reviewer. I guess that there are always things you can learn from other people and I think that's always been my approach. Have open eyes, open ears and listen to ideas and thoughts um, as well as to ensure that what I am doing from my point of view is consistent. One of the things that every practitioner probably uh, understands is that when you're look, looking and doing things every day, you don't always necessarily take a step back and consider is this in line with what my quality control manual states? Is this in line with what my risk management framework states? Have they been updated regularly? Are they reflective of my practice operations? So I welcome the opportunity. Um, and is there any concern on this? There's no concern because even if there was something that wasn't always considered to be, uh, to be altered or improved, I welcome that opportunity. Uh, but I think also from my point of view, I'm very confident that my practice runs the way I would like to see it run and from a compliance point of view, from a professional compliance point of view, I'm very happy with that. But that's not to say that there aren't improvements and interestingly enough, when I'm actually on review for members, even the highly compliant practices still have just as many questions as practices perhaps that haven't paid as much attention to um, some of the professional standards. 
That's one of the greatest advantages of the quality review program that we talk to members under review about is that you have a reviewer coming in who has seen in, in particularly in Margot's cases, hundreds of practices over mm. their years with the quality review program. And Mark, even in your case, mm. in the tens of, re, of practices, whereas when you're in, pub, in practice yourself, you, you are immersed in your own practice and therefore perhaps don't get the opportunity to see how other practices run. Mm. That's a huge advantage, being able to have someone come into your practice who not only runs their own practice, but also sees the operations of hundreds of other practices all around Australia, because we review members from every state in, in Australia and from every region within Australia. Wherever a member holds a public practice certificate, we go and we do those reviews. Have any of, or either of you, been gone to another state or travelled for your quality reviews? How does that work? I've done numerous interstate reviews, um, principally uh, Western Australia and uh, South Australia. And effectively, it's the process is very similar. The firms or the, the members under review more than happy to accommodate the fact that someone is coming in from interstate. Travel times can sometimes be a little uh, taxing by the end of the day, but foremost it's just another location. And I think from a member's point of view, it's actually, especially for some of the smaller um, areas around Australia, it provides them the comfort that there's not somebody within their regional area look, overlooking their practice. So they do tend to be quite open um, and relaxed when they know that somebody's coming from interstate. So we've taken the approach where we look at a member's competitive or geographical location and from a competitive position, we wouldn't want to send anyone into a, a practice that potentially might be a competitor of that particular member. But not only that, from that perspective is that all of our reviewers are under very strict confidentiality arrangements, aren't they, where our members can rest assured that in the 22 years of, of the quality review being operational within CPA Australia, we have not had one instance of, of a member's confidentiality being breached or, or there being any deleterious effects on a member's clientele because of a quality review. Is that the case? Oh, absolutely. Uh, on review, we're not entitled under the stipulations of <coughs> excuse me, the quality review program. Uh, everything's by review code. There's no names, there's no uh, recognition of the member of the firm or by client name. Um, each client is represented by just a number, one, two, three, up to however many clients are being reviewed. Members only reviewed by, uh, referred to by their review code. So the member will receive benefit out of the review, but certainly from an external point of view and security point of view, even though the information that gets conveyed from myself to the quality review team within CPA Australia, if anyone were to look at that other than the review code, they wouldn't have any understanding of the member or even of the uh, clients that, re that were reviewed. Yeah, clients are never mentioned. Names are not put anywhere. Um, I always say to members, you know, I'm looking at a client file, but I don't. I'm looking at the processes in the file, um, not the actual numbers. You know, like I don't care whether the client turns over millions of dollars or they turn over hundreds of thousands. It doesn't matter. That is not the issues that we are looking at. We are looking at the processes and the way that you actually put together those files and how you prepare the work for your clients. And so. CPA Australia makes that abundantly clear to all of our reviewers Definitely. that these Absolutely. very strict confidentiality yep requirements are, are imposed and are enforced yep. and, and are, are contracted for mm -hmm. as well. Correct. Yep. That's actually what I've mentioned to members too as part of the process that it is incumbent on us as reviewers and under contract with CPI Australia to ensure that everything is maintained at the highest level of confidentiality. Well Mark and Margot, it looks like it's quite a rigorous process in terms of the recruitment of reviewers. Why do you think that the, the management of CPI Australia have have instituted such a rigorous process in terms of ensuring that the people that are doing these reviews are at the forefront of their profession? Certainly from a member point of view, if they're allowing somebody to come into their practice, they expect that that person would have the level of expertise and professionalism to undertake a review. The level of expertise and technical content is 
almost these days I think are given. It's just expected. Um, and that's important as part of conveying elements of the review to the member that they actually understand why. If, th if there's something that could be improved upon, they can actually understand why we're mentioning that and discussing that and more importantly providing solutions and how they could actually potentially address it in line with their practice operations. I think the other thing that's important is that as we are effectively privileged to walk into another business, because at the end of the day that's what it is, it's somebody else's business that they're opening up to us, there has to be an accepted level of professionalism and understanding of what we're being allowed to review and so therefore we take that extremely seriously. Mm. When we're looking at recruiting new reviewers, technical expertise goes without saying. We, we obviously need our reviewers to be at the forefront of the profession from a technical knowledge standpoint. But the thing that we find most important when we're looking to recruit our reviewers is around their personal skills, is around how they interact with other people, how they can convey messages, how they will go about conducting a review. Because it's critically important for us that our members feel comfortable, that they feel that they can approach our reviewer for assistance if they feel that it's necessary, and that they don't feel in a position of being intimidated or, or overwhelmed by the information that's been given to them. So what are some of the things that you do to help our members feel comfortable when you're about to go in and review a practice? I probably try to build a lot of rapport early on uh, through the planning meeting, which usually is conducted via phone, uh, but I always try to touch base prior to actually locking in a date for a planning meeting. Uh, sometimes it can be done via email, but generally I try to build that rapport very quickly. More importantly for the member also to, I suppose, be able to feel comfortable with the process. Make sure that there's no questions at that stage, but step them through the process a little bit. Uh, a lot of members take the opportunity to listen to the webinar that's produced by CPA Australia or attend a seminar in relation to the QA review process. That certainly assists um, as part of explaining the process. But I think the most important element is to sit there and is to actually listen to what the members' expectations are and what their understanding of the process is and to ensure that that is effectively on point with what the program is all about. It then means by the time, I guess from a review point of view, by the time I walk into their practice, it's almost like we know each other very well and that we've actually had a number of chats. So certainly from that point of view, I've, it's, I've never had a combatant type of approach or issue from any member. Um, and most of them have actually enjoyed the process. And I think, again, that approach of providing insight into opportunities within their own practice and practice structure is, allows them to see it as a positive outcome and a positive approach, not, uh, as I said before, the tick and bash approach. Mm. Yeah. Margot, we can't get away from it being a com there being a compliance element to our program. Oh, there has to be. We, we can't get away from that. but. We really try to ensure that our members gain some value through the quality review program. Where a member has a, a, a world recognised or a world class practice and they're fully compliant, obviously there's going to be different levels of value that a member can gain through the quality review process. But how do you add value when you go out and do a review? What are some of the things or the questions you might ask to try and add value to a member throughout the quality review process? Try and look at w what procedures are in place in the practice and just how they're putting, um, how they work through things. All practices feel that they are unique in their own space and, and they are. Um, I haven't been in two practices that are the same. So it's more about going through and talking to them about what do they want to achieve, where, where, is, where is the practice going. Um, for some practices, they're looking at becoming paperless. Okay, well, we have been in some, I've been in some practices that are now paperless. This is how they have achieved it. And we talk about the systems that could be put in place to help them go through that process. So it's more about how are you coping now? And if, if they're doing really well and their practice is going well, where do you want to be? How, how are you looking at achieving that? And then talk them through that process and maybe give them some suggestions of how that process could be best managed. Um, and sort of, I suppose, because we have been in a number of practices, you've seen lots of ways that 
that practitioners handle different situations and they may have a particular problem in their practice um, that they just, that has maybe even only crept up in the last little while and you step them through it and help them with that. And I often find that, you know, I do give them my number if they want to help, if they want to hand later, they do. And I, there's a couple of practitioners who, um, that I still mentor to some extent because they will ring me on certain issues. They're newly in practice. Um, I did their first reviews and they just want some assistance as they're going forward. And I find that practitioners really, um, it's about interrelationships. It's about getting that networking happening. And I encourage all practitioners to network as much as possible, to join discussion groups, to meet with other practitioners, but also not just within your profession, but other people outside of your profession that actually assist your clients. Mm. So I think that's really important as well. And that, that networking is really um, one of the things that I do discuss with members and how they can network with within their profession and also with other professions as well. So. CPA Australia produces a whole suite of tools and resources that are available particularly to our public practitioners to assist them with where they are in the now but also that piece about where they are going to be or where they want to be in future. Is that something that you talk to members about at, at reviews? What, what resources are available to them and how they might go about finding those or utilising those resources? Yeah, uh, a lot of members have probably looked at the website more on an ad hoc basis or as needs be. As they go through the review process, you tend to find that they are using that more as a tool, or not on necessarily an everyday basis, but certainly a lot more regularly than perhaps in the past. And, and I guess it, they probably then fully appreciate the resources that are there, whether they be checklists, whether they be part and parcel of the quality control manual as a template and framework. Uh, but it's also, there's a lot of other tools and information there that will assist them. Uh, there's the information technology, uh, uh, I think it's the um, business disruption plan or something along those lines. And succession planning. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. a lot of those type of issues, perhaps they're considered only every now and again by a practitioner, but at least that they know that the resources are there when they need them or if they need to look at uh, those type of issues within their practice. Because quite often the difficulty is not knowing what you don't know and then once you do know, knowing where to find that information to help you move to the next, yeah. take it to the next step yeah. within yeah. your practice. That brings us on to moving into the future. So how do you think quality procedures can future-proof an accounting practice, Margot? The policies and procedures that you set down for your practice give you the way that you are responding at that particular point in time. Um, it also helps you when you bring new staff on board they have a, a process to go through in your practice. Um, putting in your quality systems means that when a new standard or an update happens, you only have to tweak that system. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, generally. You, you're more modifying your existing documentation and going forward. By having those systems there, it makes the everyday job of being an accountant much, much easier. Um, and therefore, and I think from the future perspective too, if your systems are really good, if something happens and you can't be there for a day or two, it, your practice still can run. The, the systems are there, you know your staff knows those systems. And also, it makes it a more saleable practice down the track. You know, like if you've got good systems, you've got good quality results happening in your practice, then that helps for your future. Without a doubt. So it's being at a really good starting point so you can deflect what comes your way or embrace the opportunities that come your exactly. way because you're starting off from a very rigorous starting point with respect to the standards, your policies and procedures that are within the practice and then being able to be ready to take it to the next level. That's what I'm hearing from you, Margot. Yep. Mark, do you have anything to comment on Absolutely. relation to future-proofing? The opportunity to be able to fall back and review a document that you've already got within your practice structure, being the risk management framework or the quality control manual, allow that becomes the cornerstone of decision making as far as bringing it back to the ground level. By altering or changing the direction of the practice, it's always a guideline to refer back to those manuals and 
look at how those manuals need to be updated to, st to I suppose, use as a checkpoint, but also then to cater for considerations that may not have been thought of as part of the ongoing future of the practice. So as an example, practice may wish to go more online with some of their uh, resources or client communications. That's great. What are the risks? And so, and there are risks with doing so. There are also benefits. By bringing that within the risk management framework, it just alerts the practitioner to consider those issues that maybe they may have just gone down a particular path without that consideration. And we all know as public practitioners that we have to keep abreast of so many changes, so many developments, let alone the intricacies of each of our client files and, and what our particular clients might be doing in their unique businesses themselves. Having, this, having these documents and these processes and procedures in place, do you find it's good to just jog your memory every now and again as to what items you really do need to be reviewing, especially from a risk management perspective, where you've got so many different elements that you need to consider within respect to, to managing risk within your practice, having a particular document which sets out a formula for going about regular monitoring of, of those risks, do you find that a useful tool in not necessarily having to keep everything at the front of mind? Yeah, absolutely. And I think just a classic, an example would be using uh, cloud-based software, but like as an interaction between client and practitioner. Uh, there are elements that really need to be considered from a not only a practice point of view, but also a client engagement point of view. And certainly from a best practice consideration, a lot of firms are now ensuring that there is elements within their engagement letter content that actually addresses the, not so much security of the cloud, but the transmittal of data between client and practice. Mm -hmm. So that security or privacy principles aren't breached and uh, certainly from a security and data protection point of view, it's managed accordingly. And again, that comes back to the risk management framework. Mm, mm, very important points. We often say that the quality review process compels our members to spend time working on their practice rather than in the practice. How does working on the practice set it up for success in the here and now? Well, the thing is, if you're working in your practice, like what we tend to do is we all have lots of deadlines and we get very busy and we get very busy work, as I think of it, as, and, and we're constantly, that next deadline's coming for either tax or, or whatever lodgements and things that we have to do. But I think all practitioners need to step back and have a look at their practice and how their processes are running. And yes, you might have a deadline in a week's time, but if you step back and have a look at it, you can then see how you can put things in place to meet those deadlines. Um, but also you need to be looking at your practice procedures and just how things are going in your practice um, from an overall point of view rather than just every day running. Um, so by stepping back and having a look at our practices, we want, we're running a business and we all advise our clients to step back and have a look at their, their businesses and have a look at their processes and get more efficient. We need to do the same in our own practices. And Financially, we're going to be better off if our practices are running better. Um, and I just think, yeah, you need to step back and have a look at the, the big picture. So to well. use an analogy, working in your practice day to day, getting from one deadline to the next deadline to the next is, is basically like treading water. It is. To keep your head above water, to keep meeting those deadlines. But then working on your practice is about taking those freestyle strides to get to, to wherever it is you're going. Yeah, and it's about stepping back and having a look and saying, okay, this is where we are now, where do we want to be? And taking the initi initiation of that to get where you want to be rather than, it's being proactive rather than reactive mm. to things, yeah. Which is incredibly important in the environment yeah. that, the work, that we, we currently operate in as public practitioners. Yeah. I guess for the here and now, it also allows the practitioner to consider staffing levels and uh, work processes, that they're consistent, that they're following guidelines, that the output from the practice, if it's uh, prepared by different teams, different staff members, that it is actually consistent as opposed to just quickly looking at a set of accounts or uh, final reports, tax documents, audit documents as a final process. It actually allows that, uh, I suppose, consistency of approach to work and uh, conduct of work and output 
which is absolutely paramount as uh, as is. we're running at a hundred miles an hour. <laughs> it is, it is. I, I know recently in my office we found that one staff member was doing things quite differently to everybody else, and we had to have a staff meeting and sort of say, hey, you know, we need to pull it all into line because everyone needs to be doing it in the same format. Because if you're not here, no one knows where you've filed things or done certain things. So it's important that you get that consistency and you need to have those sort of meetings and overall look at how everyone is dealing with things in the practice. Mm, very good point. So focusing now on those freestyle strides to get us to the end of the pool or wherever it is that we're going to, the services that accountants provide today may look very different in the future. Where do you see the future for accountants in public practice? We might start with you, Mark. Technology is driving yep. a lot of change and it's not only just being driven by practitioners, it's being driven by regulatory authorities. I think probably one of the most topical issues at the moment is uh, the, the tax officer's approach to technology and online communication. Whilst we probably haven't seen the full impact of it at this stage, there is no doubt that there's going to be a lot of direct communication from the ATO and other regulatory authorities direct to and with clients. Some clients are already doing that now, that's great, through their own business portal arrangements and so forth. But I think what becomes important, certainly from my point of view as a practitioner, is how do you keep in touch and almost like one step ahead of how that is a changing process. And certainly one of the things that we've implemented within the practice structure is a almost a prudential review system or a internal, I won't say necessarily internal audit, but something similar to that, where we actually address the issues and processes with a client proactively to ensure that what they are lodging direct with the ATO is as accurate as realistically possible, uh, rather than just allow them to go about their business and then find at the end of each year or at the end of a six month period that it's all potentially not as accurate as it could be. And clients have welcomed welcome that approach because they haven't really considered or, or looked at that uh, necessarily in that kind of light before. So we're almost trying to future-proof future, future proof a business as a client against regulatory uh, issues and, and compliance issues that ordinarily we wouldn't be aware of until well down the track. And by that stage, it's almost trying to undo what's already been done. There's been a lot of discussion within the profession about the, the role of the accountant in the tax space going forward. Where do you see the role for public practitioners in the tax space going forward? And do you think that there are other areas that our public practitioners should be really having a look at or, or examining about whether it might be an appropriate area for their practice to venture into? I think there will be changes and clients will be receptive to those changes from the re regulatory authorities. But I think certainly from a practitioner's point of view, it's now more than ever before it's important to be providing proactive and accurate advice to a client and I think the days probably have or nearly passed where it becomes very much historical recording. We've now seen such a progression of online uh, software tools that allow clients to interact directly with accountants and so forth. So now the advice element becomes very important. So a lot of budgeting work, a lot of business planning work, um, reviewing, securing and altering finance arrangements, restructuring work, consideration of asset protection, um, a lot of, I suppose, certainly where there's uh, multi uh, or external uh, owners within a business to ensure that, you know, the right structures are set up, that the right protection is in place. A lot of work that perhaps is harder than compliance work, if I can use that word, but certainly more rewarding and certainly more accepting from a client's point of view as well. Yeah, I, I think that compliance is changing. I don't think that we're going to be non, that we're going to have less compliance as such. I think it's different compliance. Mm. It's compliance in other areas where we mightn't be doing the simple I returns as such, or that certain areas of our practice are definitely going to change. Um, but we're finding that clients now come for us for more advice in relation to software, in relation to cloud, you know, how is it best for them to get their own um, systems in place within their own businesses. So as much as, and it's mainly to meet the compliance obligations of the ATO and the regulators. So the compliance is just changing. And I think our involvement with that 
is changing. I agree that we're definitely looking at real-time figures rather than historical information. It's much more important to be talking about what the client's doing now and it's much more interesting mm. than looking at what they did 12 months ago. Um, it's what, what they're doing now and how they're going. Um, but definitely with um, compliance, I just feel that there's a lot more compliance happening from the ATO um, and our clients need our assistance in meeting those requirements. Mm. Um, so it's just, it, we're, I suppose as accountants, we've always been evolving as far as I'm concerned. We, things have changed. We've gone from paper, paperless computers. Technology is bringing that. And we have, we're along for the ride. Um, so I just think that we, we can give a great deal of assistance to our clients in lots of different ways um, on their compliance journey as well. Mark, you mentioned about advice. That leads me into my next question here. Financial services are a growth area, not just for financial planners, but for accountants also. How have you prepared your practice and your own skills for this service offering? And especially in light in, with respect to the accountant's exemption, which will be removed from 1st of July this year. How have you been preparing your practice for those particular areas of service? Margot, we might start with you this time. Okay, we, well my practice has quite a, a large self-managed super fund base and I'm an auditor of self-managed super funds as well. <coughs> um, so I felt that was an area that my clients still required my expertise in. So I have done my financial planning um, diploma, which I did last year, and now I've signed up with a, um, as an authorised representative of a financial planning organisation and we will be offering financial planning within our practice. I looked at doing the limited licence. Um, my concern there was that the client would actually have to go to me for certain parts of the advice and then somewhere else for the other part. Um, and I just felt that that was such an additional cost for them. Um, and most of my clients come to us to ask the questions anyway and they rely on us as their, as their advisors. So we decided to take and, and run with it. And um, so yes, we'll, we will be offering the financial planning advice in future to our clients. And so that's be been quite a, a process, shall I say. And it's only been, I only got an email yesterday to say that I am now registered with ASIC, so um, we can go ahead. But it has been quite, you know, it's not a five minute journey. Um, and it has been quite interesting and we've learnt so much along the way. As much as we already knew quite a lot, there was quite a lot in the um, diploma that um, has yeah, changed the way that we approach clients, changed you know, our, the way we talk to clients about certain issues. And it's been quite, um, yeah, it's been very informative for myself and for my staff. So um, as a practice, yeah, we're embracing it and going with it, so yeah. Mark, how has the financial services industry or financial planning services in particular impacted on your practices? Because I've had, I suppose, some background over the years within financial services, a lot of the information I've, I guess in some respects, overlaid to a business level as well. So a lot of business advisory has been taken, I suppose, of uh, bits and pieces from the financial planning process. From a practice point of view, um, the practice will be applying for a corporate authorisation uh, or uh, authorisation or authorised rep status with CPA Australia Advice. And um, I, from my point of view, that's more from a badging and certainly from an independence issue and arrangement. It's not right for everybody to the extent, not so much the licensee, but the actual authorised rep or limited licence arrangement, it really becomes a business case and it's for each practice to okay. assess their own, um, I suppose, future of the practice and of their business. Uh, I've spoken to many who wish to go down that path. I've also spoken to many who have said we'd rather not be involved in it. My concern is if they're not going to be involved in the advice element, where does it leave a large component of their practice? how much do they really want to outsource and, and is that something that's accepting to the client? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is actually provide an appropriate service to clients. And I yeah. think we need to keep that in the back of our minds as far as what is or is not appropriate from a financial services uh, regulation point of view. 
it's definitely changing the playing field for most of our practitioners either now or, or within the imminent future isn't it it's a it's a huge change coming up and i think it, time time has almost become uh, our worst enemy it's come up very quickly and if i think back to three years ago within the transitional period of, like and i was certainly of the view too it'll that's too far away, we won't worry about it. But I'm still speaking with people, even as recent as yesterday and today, where they're still wanting to actually become registered through the uh, RG146 re uh, yeah. education requirements. And effectively, they've run out of time to do that. And that's certainly not a problem. They can still do that. It's just that they will be restricted on what they can advise in certain areas from 1 July until such a time that they're authorised. The other thing too, of course, is that the exemption really only removes the advice in relation to setting up and closing down a super fund. There's a lot of elements, I think, that all practitioners need to be mindful of when it comes to advising on superannuation, that it really is the domain of uh, the financial services regulator these days, not themselves, unless they're licensed. Yeah. And th there's a number of ways that each practice can do that. They don't necessarily have to become financial service providers themselves, but they need to at least align with somebody or be comfortable with where their clients are going. And to, they've to needed to examine it. Yeah, they need mm. to have looked at it. Yeah, it And needs decided to be what their approach is going to be. They're in, they're out, or they've got some sort of arrangement in place. Um, yeah. Leading on to regulation, every year regulation continues to become more prescriptive for the accounting profession. How does your quality control framework assist you in managing changes to standards and legislation? Um, we have our yeah we have a quality control framework and we readdress that on a regular basis. So, you know we're often looking at it and how our procedures are. So if there's new standards come out, we have a look at what, how they're going to impact our practice, what changes we're going to need to put into place, and so therefore how that's going to change our procedures and, and policies within our practice. And so it gets addressed each time changes happen and it's more and more often. Mm. <laughs> um, so it's something that is probably more an agenda item on meetings on a regular basis now um, that we actually do look at it and do see how we're going to, how we're going to put that into our practice. What is a practical effect of it? But that's yeah. a really good point that you make there, Margot, that it's an agenda item. Yeah. Instead of it becoming something that is is huge and something that might take a huge amount of time from the principals in the practice working on to develop from scratch having those policies and procedures in place means that it is just an agenda item that's regularly maintained and regularly viewed so you're, you're constantly making little changes rather than it being a huge mm. impost on your practice at that particular point in time it's better to attack things in little bites you know, we had three years for the exemption. You know, everyone needed, you need to take the steps and do the things as you can mm -hmm. and slot them in, in in our busy practices. So yeah, it has to be an agenda item. You have to look at what is coming up. What's the next thing that is about to change? What do, how do we address that? How does CPA Australia help you with that? Often with the emails, we're, we're alerted. Um, through regular correspondence, so I know I get quite a lot of emails from CPA and the CPA updates. Um, so you can be alerted that something is about to change or um, it might even be a year away, but you know it's coming. So you, and often they have the PD as well on that particular um, item and you... So we use the resources that are available to <coughs> us. So. For example, we do go out in CPA update. Quite often, more often than not, there is an element there that is specifically related to our public practitioners, in particular quality review as well. We also have a lot of articles within In Practice or in the Black Magazine, as well as our tools and resources that are on our website. But we are constantly looking for touch points with our membership to get across messages with an ample amount of time for our practitioners to prepare to institute changes that might be coming up. So those particular forms of correspondence, although some might not be necessarily relevant to all elements of your practice, it's definitely something worth keeping abreast of because that's where it'll be highlighted to our practitioners that there are changes afoot and that 
our practitioners need to be across what those particular changes are if they relate to the services that they're offering. Exactly. Uh, absolutely. Look, I think the, the hyperlink style of the CPA uh, tax or the CPA updates, where it does effectively hyperlink straight into the website, also encourages practitioners to be looking at other areas within that sector of the website within public practice but also an important element of the quality control manual and the risk management framework governed by the professional standards is that it is regularly reviewed it isn't a document just to leave sitting on the shelf or sitting on the server that no one looks at and I think the concept yeah. of an agenda item at uh, partners meetings or on a some type of on business uh, case is, is an excellent approach because then you are regularly reviewing it and more importantly you've got evidence to suggest that you are regularly reviewing it and fr certainly from a quality uh, assurance point of view and the review process it is one of the things that uh, we look at as reviewers to see that the actual manuals are reviewed on a regular basis and that they are kept in line with the practice. There might be many sole practitioners watching this particular episode saying that's all well and good Mark but I'm a sole practitioner with potentially one staff member or an administration staff member. Why do I need a set of quality control procedures? Why do I need a risk management process? Surely everything rests with me. How would you respond to that? And maybe take the position of, of looking at it from a succession planning point of view. Absolutely, certainly from a succession planning point of view, whether it be mandatory, uh, whether it be planned or unplanned. Um, certainly from a sole practitioner point of view, uh, sickness, ill health, accident can uh, alter the opportunity to be able to practice on a regular or full-time basis. They may need somebody to come into their practice, they may have staff that need to step up. At least it provides them guidelines and it provides almost like a pro procedural aspect as to how, how things are done within the practice that they may not have been fully aware of. It also probably allows them to step up and actually understand why they're doing certain things, you know, and whether that be from a client perspective or whether it be from a regu regulatory perspective, but at least they actually have that understanding. I could take the alternate and say that the actual professional standards which are mandatory do actually require these, um, this information to be documented, which is all part of the approach. But I think what is important is that by having it documented, at least it gives the practitioner whether, it, whether it's themselves solely or whether they do have a couple of staff, it certainly gives them guidelines and certainly gives them something to refer back to. And as we discussed earlier, if they're altering the direction of their practice, mm. it almost becomes a, a viewpoint and, and consideration as to which way they should head and what you know, some of the areas they should consider. Great response. As reviewers, and members of CPA Australia, what do you see as the opportunities and challenges for public practitioners over the coming two to five years? I think the challenges are actually the opportunities as well. Um, from the point of view, I think the challenges are going to be the changes in the regulation um, and the changes in technology that's coming forward. But I think they're also opportunities in that we can use that new technology to be able to give and deliver to our clients up-to-date and current advice, um, which is much, much more enjoyable to be doing. And also, um, although the regulator now stipulates we must do things in a certain way, well, okay, so this is the way we have to produce it, this is the way we have to do it, but, you know, let's look at how that is a good way to deliver the information to our clients. Um, the regulators, I mean, the ATO is definitely changing the, our playing field. We're definitely finding that they are contacting clients much more often, so that, that is something that we have to deal with. It's also about us keeping up to date then as to what's happening with our clients and how things are going. But that's an opportunity then to touch base with clients on a more regular basis to say, okay, or let them know that if the ATO, do, ATO does contact them, that they can then ring you and you're there to help them. So it's creating that more personal one-on-one -on -one so. service. I think so. I think as much as there are all these things about to happen, you can use them as opportunities and, and to promote your own business and to assist your clients. And then making sure that the accountant is front of mind in that business holder who happens to be the client as well, but in that exactly. business holder's mind as their trusted advice provider. Yes. Mark, what do you see as the opportunities and challenges for the next two to five years? I think one of the main challenges is time. 
um, how many hours are there in a day? And, and from that, and it is a real challenge. It's a challenge that I think everybody faces now. But I think also there, there are opportunities to be gained from uh, IT changes and, and improvements and improvements is in practices using IT. So I think there are, there are ways that f time can be freed up, but more importantly, I think there is the challenge that sometimes from a practice point of view, we might have some great ideas to discuss with a client, but then we fall back into the issue of, well, do we have time to address it? Let's say we raise these things with a client. Let's say the client wants to do that, whatever it may be. and then we've got to go back to the office and actually find the time or, or the skill set and staffing resources to be able to achieve what we've actually set out to do. That then becomes a reconfiguration of the practice and I think to be to be considered whether they should be doing a lot of compliance work or is or can that be more uh, automated to allow some of the, I suppose what I could say in inverted commas, value add, but more importantly to consider it from a client's point of view take a step back and actually think of yourself as a client and think what do I as a client wish to receive from my accountant and all of a sudden the direction tends to change and I think the, the problem that we all suffer from is that we do get caught up in compliance or regulatory issues mm -hmm. and it's almost a matter of taking a step back and push that to one side and then consider what other opportunities there are with clients. And finally to sum up what are your top tips from members from a quality review perspective? I think from the time that they're actually, from a member being notified of a review, is to not be concerned about the process, certainly if it's their first review. Educate themselves on the process by webinars or by attending the seminar, but embrace the situation, look at it as an opportunity to actually improve the practice uh, management of, of their business to ensure that there is consistency, to ensure that the approach to their work and outcomes is appropriate and in accordance with the professional standards. Margot? I agree. I think to embrace it rather than fight it, so to speak, um, and use the quality reviewer per person. Um, ask them lots of questions. Get them involved in your practice. Um, they're there to help and assist. So. Go through the process by all means, and but talk to them, ask them questions, and when they're there, you know, in the planning meeting, they're actually there in your practice for usually a day. Um, ask them as much as you need to know, and even afterwards, you can contact them and talk to them about different issues. So, it it's not just that that whole process, or not just that that day in your practice. It, it's, it's quite a bit more than that. So there is a planning, um, you have the opportunity to discuss things then and use their knowledge to improve the, thing, the systems in your practice. Great responses and also too knowing that if we do find a, an area of non-compliance that really it's just an opportunity to improve what you're doing and to ensure that you're doing the best thing that you possibly can by, for yourself and for your practice, mm. yeah. N not taking it as a reflection on your pra on, on as a negative reflection, but as an opportunity to improve what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Margot and Mark, thank you so much for joining me today and for your insights into the quality review process, as well as your insights into being public practitioners under the banner of CPA Australia. It's been great to have you today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. you.